Oops, I just dropped my pens. <laughs> Welcome to the 69th episode, right? 69th? I think so. Okay, um, one yeah. work, five questions with Dr. Mark Holichak, that is he, and yeah. Donna Vitek, that is I. Um, so uh, today we'll be talking about a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote um, to William Evans on February 22nd, 1801, um, discussing a little bit uh, of discussion on James Hemings. And we'll get into that more after our credentials. Um, so Dr. Holacek comes to us as a professor of philosophy and history who taught at institutions such as University of Pittsburgh, University of Michigan, Rutgers University, Camden University and Ohio University. Um, he has numerous published books. Um, I have too many cross outs here to keep it straight on my, I still have the original paper. Um, 27. 27. 27. Okay, I'm going to yeah, circle uh, 27 for today. Jefferson. So, yeah, for today is 27 on Jefferson and, and over 200 essays on Thomas Jefferson. Um, with our show One Work, Five Questions, I'll ask Dr. Holacek five questions on one work of Thomas Jefferson. So this um, last week in our 68th episode, two weeks ago, we covered the who, what, when, where, and why of Jefferson's notes on Virginia. We examine today a much neglected topic, Jefferson's rocky relationship with his much trusted slave, James Hemings. Well, his, and that, and that name may ring a bell to some of you, Hemings. Um, well, his relationship with his slave, yeah, Sally, Hemings, Sally's brother, yeah, James's sister has been much scrutinized, um, though it is doubtful that there was anything between the two. Jefferson was for some reason, especially fond of James Hemings, so much so that he took James with him to France and paid for him to learn, um, how to cook French cuisine. Uh, yet James gave signs of being an especially troublesome, even violent youth. Um, why then was Jefferson so fond of James? It's not, we're going to find out. In this episode, we critically analyze a letter from Thomas Jefferson to William Evans, dated February 22nd, 1801, concerning Jefferson's need for a French chef in Washington. James's well-being and possibly of bringing him um, a now free slave back to Monticello. Uh, so this this is going to be very interesting. Um and um, James's desire um, to return to be with Thomas Jefferson. Um, okay, so I'm Donna Vitek, and this is One Work, Five Questions, episode 69. So are you- Getting up there, that's, that's quite a few. That's over a year's worth of work, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think we should trade books. Can I borrow a book? This is my London library. I can't really fuss about it right oh. now. So you're, I see you're trying to turn the tables on me, and it won't work. <laughs> yeah, that's your Come line. On, Jeff. Okay, the question number the one. one. Oh, there's on, Jeff. Jeffy. Hi, Jeffy. He heard your voice, and he uh... he loves me. Somebody in the world loves me. So yes, um, <laughs> he loves okay. me too, and that sort of scares me. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh, I was going to say he has good taste, but uh, anyway, let's get on with the show. <laughs> well. Okay. Question number one. You told me in a private communication that you wish to focus in this letter on Thomas Jefferson's relationship with his um, slave, James Hemings. Yet there are two sentences about James. <laughs> so why this letter? Well, they're, you know, they're trying to find if you want to, talk about James Hemings, there are really no letters that give you a portal into the relationship between the two. So a lot of what we're going to say today is somewhat speculative and uh, viewers might be a little bit taken aback that I don't answer all the questions that we propose to answer. Because at the end of the day, I'm, I'm somewhat perplexed about Jefferson's fondness for James and James' fondness for Thomas Jefferson. So we're going to, you know, and, and I, I suspect, and I wrote a short essay on this to be published soon. Uh, I, I want these videos to be, and my essay to be, portals into the uh, into the relationship between the two, um, not 
not pieces that answer all the questions that ask perhaps more questions than the answer, but to invite other people to explore things further. So, yeah, there's not much written about it, but, um, you know, I could pick another letter that talks about James um, in which he won't be discussed that much either. So, you know, that's that. Okay. <laughs> uh, question number two. Can you give us some background information on James Hemings? Like, who was he? What sort of relationship did he have with Thomas Jefferson prior to him being freed? I'm, I, I mean, we can assume that he had a, a good relationship if he was um, uh, wanted to return. Well, all we can do is assume. I mean, uh, we, well, we, we do know that that presumably that Thomas Jefferson liked James. I mean, I'll say that. Uh, why? I don't know. Um, he was well, he born. Does, he did he was, state in his in the letter um, that uh, that uh, the person that Thomas Jefferson was writing to, William Evans, um, told him that he that James uh, was kept himself always free to come to me. So that says tells us that. I mean, he kept, you don't keep yourself free to be at the whim of another person unless you really like them. Yeah, uh, well, we're, we're going to, you know, we, we will answer some questions here. But I mean, um, the relation, he was born in 1765. And he was, uh, when he moved to Paris with Thomas, he was 19, 1784. So he's a young man. Um, he was the second of six children to Betsy Hemings. And Hemings was uh, a she was in concubinage with, uh, I don't know what that means either, but she was uh, she was partnered with John Wales, a white sea captain, was also the mother of Jefferson's wife. Okay. So Sally Hemings was stepsister to Jefferson's wife. That would, of course, uh, account for all the privileges that the Hemings had, is that uh, there were relatives to Jefferson's wife. And so, so Betsy has six children. He's the second of those children. Betsy also has four other paramours, four other lovers, and 12 children in all, uh, but four, six with Wales. Now, at 19, he goes to Paris, and he suffers a, uh, immediately suffers a lengthy and very, very costly illness that uh, sets Jefferson back several, I think it's 200 francs or something, where, you know. Um, when he goes to France, we have evidence, you know, we're going to talk about some of the negatives with respect to James, because if you look at the Monticello website, they only talk about him as being, you know, as Monticello does with all the slaves, they they don't give you a full picture. They talk about the better, the good things, not the bad things, but we're going to do both today. And um, Jefferson mentions and writes to Antonio Jenny on February 5, 1786, he, and he's talking about James, has forgot to speak English and has not learned to speak French. Now, if we take that literally, and Jefferson, I always profess we take Jefferson literally, is clear indication that, that James is having trouble speaking French. And I, I assume he's tongue-in-cheek when he says he's forgot to speak English. I, I assume he just means He's not in a capacity where he can speak English that often with anyone, most people speaking French, and he's not picking up on the French language. So he uh, he uh, he winds up taking a, a, a tutorial to learning grammar in French under a certain person by the name of Perrault. And what we learn, so one thing, he's not good with languages. Does that mean that he's challenged intellectually, perhaps, we don't know, but he just didn't pick up French too easily. And when he, Jefferson, you know, has him take uh, lessons in the French language with a certain Perot uh, on James's own initiative. James has to pay for them. He wants to learn the language. And what happens is Perot comes back at some time early in 1789, the year in which Jefferson later in the year goes back to uh, the United States, uh, comes back and he wants to inquire about the money that James owes him. And he wants doesn't want to go to James, because presumably James is cantankerous, quarrelsome. Um, and he beats, he, he sees, he 
meets James along the way, and James beats him up and tears his coat and everything. And and uh, uh, Perot is is incensed by that. He tells Jefferson, "Well, this guy not only beat me up, he tore my coat. It's winter; I can't go out." We don't know what happened. With that. So it, it, what we do know is he had trouble with the language, and at this point, he um, he had language lessons, and he he was prone to violence. Uh -huh. It seems to me. I don't want to say he would behind behave violently all the time. So that right. creates right off the bat some problems for our understanding of Jefferson's liking of James. Why did Jefferson want to take someone who was quarrelsome, cantankerous, violent, perhaps with him to France? Wouldn't that cause trouble? And if Jefferson knew that the young boy was sort of slightly intellectually challenged, wouldn't you take a slave uh, with you that was uh, that could pick up in the language a little bit easier? He doesn't. So, I mean, there are some questions I'm going to answer here. But anyways, to, to end the question, I'll talk about at some point, James asks Jefferson for his freedom, right? And Jefferson comes with an agreement, and I'll read the agreement. Having been at great expense and having James Hemings taught the art of cookery, desiring to befriend him and to acquire from him as little in return as possible, I do here pry, promise and declare that if the said James shall go with me to Monticello, in the course of the ensuing winter, when I go to reside there myself, and shall there continue until he shall have taught such person as I shall place under him for that purpose to be a good cook, this previous condition being performed, he shall be thereupon made free, and I will thereupon execute all my proper instruments to make him free. He signs it. It's the 15th day of September of 1793, many years, a uh, few years after they get back to, and uh, James fulfills the pledge, the promise to teach someone else. He teaches his younger brother, whose name I think is Peter, to be a chef, and James is free to go on his own. And but wow. notice what Jefferson says early on, I've been at great expense to teach him cookery. I mean, it, cost him, it did cost him a lot of money. I, I had a great desire to befriend him, not just to be, you know, have him there as uh, someone to do chores for me, but to be a friend. And I've asked little from him in return. Now, is Jefferson exaggerating here and, and downplaying uh, James' affection for him, or is James not really reciprocating much? Where Jefferson is giving him a lot, teaching him this and that, and James is returning very little. Perhaps that's the case. We don't know. Hmm. Okay. That's interesting. Okay, who who was um, Francis Sayes, and why is he important in this story? Mm, he mentions him in, you know, if you go to the second paragraph, he talks about Francis Sayes. I think that's how you pronounce it. Sayes? Okay. Sayes. I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, he says, Sayes lived with me formally, and since that, you know, he said, uh, uh, was he a slave? Was he a laborer? Presumably he was a slave as well. We don't know. He said he uh, offered himself to me. So he came to Jefferson, Washington, offered himself his services to be a chef. So presumably he knows the art of cooking very well and probably knows French cuisine. And Jefferson says, um, well, he's got a wife in Baltimore. She's a washer. And he goes on to say, the problem is, is that I can take Francis with me, uh -huh. but I'd be disinclined to take his wife because she'd be uprooted from a good job as a washer. And I don't have anything, any place to put her here. I don't want to put her in my employment. It doesn't need her. And there, so there's that one problem. The second problem is Francis has a penchant for drink. So given uh -huh. that he likes his booze, uh -huh. right, uh, Jefferson is, uh, he said, uh, let me see what he says here. I told him if I, sh uh, if I should be able to employ him, I would write to him, and he returned to Baltimore on this ground. In truth, I would rather he would decline it, right? Um, and he says, I'm unwilling to reject him absolutely, Yet the fear of his drinking and of his getting his family into distress by removing them induces me to wish rather that he would decline the thought. So he's telling, uh, you know, 
William Evans, who is a tavern owner and who is uh, has access to both James and uh, Francis Says, that he's really not interested in Says. So he's just he's a he plays a larger role in this letter, but presumably Says is somebody that. James probably knows, and William Evans certainly knows both the tavern keeper. So he um, he is important that in that respect that he just you, you know he is a candidate as well as James for the position. And Jefferson doesn't say that he has any more affection for James than he does for Francis. I, I'm sure that he does. He brought him to uh, France and so forth, but. Um, yeah, I mean, so that's his role in the letter. And it's really, it's not an important part of the letter, important part of her story, but it's in there, so might as well talk about it. Oh, yeah, I get this. I get I get it now. Maybe it was a, a comparison. Okay, I could bring James back or this other guy that, but that guy had a trouble. Well, the thing is, is that James has not, as we'll see, James has not made any offers to, to join Jefferson. Jefferson wants him. Francis came to Washington right to Jefferson, says, would you take me? I can't find anything about uh, Francis says, uh, you know, I assume that he had a capacity either to, to, uh, to, to cook French foods, cuisine, or he was willing to learn or something. I don't know. Right. But he proposes. So, uh, you know, if I could find some something else on him, it'd be much more helpful. I don't think there's anything on Monticello's web page. Okay. Question number four, while Hemings is in Baltimore as a chef, Thomas Jefferson bids William Evans to tell Hemings that Tom, that he wants him as a personal chef in Washington. You mentioned in an essay on Hemings that there is a sort of cat and mouse game going on. And then Thomas Jefferson gets words of, gets word of Hemings, Hemings' suicide. Yeah, there is a cat and mouse game going on. And Jefferson writes uh, letters to um, to Evans to ask about him and and any communicating that goes on is not done directly from James Hemings to Thomas Jefferson. Perhaps James is illiterate. Perhaps he can't write. We don't know, but he certainly can communicate his thoughts, and uh, he he's choosing to do so indirectly, uh, mm -hmm. you know, not directly, and that sort of irritates Jefferson. I. I in an early letter, this was in February, I think February 22, 1801, I'm not sure of the date, uh, Evans writes to Jefferson, that part of the contents of which relative to your former servant, James, I immediately communicated to him, i.e., would you come to Washington, be my cook? He told me he was under an engagement with a certain Mr. Peck, a tavern keeper of this place, which he says was out of his power to relinquish for a few days. In other words, he he's... He has an agreement at least to, to stay there for a few more days so he can't make an immediate decision. I requested him to be particular in mentioning the time he could be in readiness to go to you. He gave me for answers that he would make up his mind in the course of the evening and let me know his determinations. But on finding that he did not call agreeable to promise, I sent for him a second time. The answer he returned to me was that he would not go until you should write to himself. So he promised, so James promised to tell Evans that, you know, the first time he communicates, I'll give you an answer at night. He doesn't show up. And, and Evans goes back to him and asks him again. And uh, James said, well, you know, I'm not going to do anything till Thomas writes me, till Thomas Jefferson writes me. So there is this cat and mouse game going on. And a lot of scholars said that Thomas is not writing James either, not directly. Maybe he doesn't even know where James is staying exactly. Uh, and one scholar thought that Jefferson just thought it was beneath him as president to have to beg, write to the slave directly and beg. No, I same thing. I think it's quite stupid. My answer to that is, is that Jefferson is president of the United States and has things to do. He can't drop everything. He can't even write his own family as much right. as he'd like to because he has other issues. So he can't just drop everything and say, Oh, let's let me, you know, let me put this issue of James Hemings right on top of all the important things that are going on. Right. And, <laughs> right. So uh, anyways, um, Jefferson writes 
Kevin's back. He says, it's on March 31, over a month later, 1801. Okay. And remember, Jefferson just assumes the presidency, I think, early in March. Right. So, And know. he's also got the Marbury versus Madison stuff going. <laughs> He's got stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. What are you talking about? He's got so many things going on. And, yeah. you know, he's, he's supposed to put this on top. He's got the midnight uh, judges, the appointments that he's playing right. around with and everything. And he's got his uh, the Jeffersonian Republicans are mad at him because he's not attacking more directly. You, you know, a lot of people loved his inaugural address when he, you know, he says we are all Federalists, we're all Republicans. Right. Uh, and that, you know, to our ears today sounds wonderful. A lot of people were angry with that. You know, no, we're not all Federalists, the Republicans said. We're Republicans. Federalists are bad. And some of the Federalists were saying that, too. So it was a wonderful speech, but it certainly rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. You know, what he was right. trying to do is reconciliation. But anyways, he writes to Evans, March 31, just into his presidency. He says, I suppose I saw in the difficulties raised by James... An unwillingness to come here, arising wholly from some attachment he had formed in Baltimore, for I cannot suspect an indisposition towards me, in other words, that he hates me, I concluded at once, therefore, not to urge him against inclination, and wrote to Philadelphia, where I'd been successful in getting a cook equal to my wishes. I'm glad Francis, that says, remains there, as I cannot bear a servant who drinks, and on the whole, am supplied to mine. I would wish James to understand that it was an acquiescence to what I supposed his own wish that I did not repeat my application after having so long rested on the expectation of having it. So Jefferson, in some sense, is saying, and I guess I side with Jefferson here, he's got a lot to do, as you said. He's got so much going on, and it's sort of like I'm just asking this young man, you know, to come in and be my cook here at the White House. Uh -huh. It would be a prestigious appointment. You understand? The question is, I didn't ask this before. Why wouldn't James, who's a free man at this time, why didn't he jump at that opportunity? Right. You put that on a resume. Yeah, you know, I was cook to the president of the United States. Right. So you know what I mean? There's something going on here between the two. I mean, there's some. You know, tension. I wonder if it was just the honestly the basic male ego because at one point James was leaving everything, uh, you know, did make whatever Jefferson wanted to to be number one to him, um, and and then to not follow through with that when he was once he was asked maybe it was just because he wasn't asked directly by Jefferson and he was like, well, then I'm not coming if he can't ask me himself you know it could have just been simple human ego yeah I, so i want to see when i talk about cat and mouse it implies that it's the male let's not talk the male it's probably male but you know males do have bad egos i don't have one do i not at all anyways so okay we'll call it male ego cat and mouse implies that both are are standing on principle and it seems to me now I think about right. this more, that's probably more James than Jefferson. Because Jefferson's not, you know, he doesn't have time to brood on this. He's right. got so much on his plate. So it's sort of like, does he want the job or not? He's probably getting angry. I'm offering here a job as, as cook to the present United States with good pay. And yet he's insisting that I have to write him directly. So I've got to take more off my time to make sure that I make him happy. So what is going on in James Bond? Is there something that happened between the two that has angered James Hemings? Yeah. Or it could just, uh, how long after that, shortly after that, did James commit suicide? So it could have just been basic depression on James's part too, that he just was not easily pleased and was looking for... Ways yeah, but I mean, if you're, if you're I, I agree with you. It's possible. Um, look, he's probably a darker skinned black person than the ones Jefferson usually frees. So it's not going to be easy for him to find work, right? In in white society in the North, in, in Baltimore, Philadelphia, he's in Baltimore. Um, so it's, you, you know, one of the problems could be being a black person. At the time. Is that causing problems mm -hmm. with him? getting on in his role as chef, even though he's highly qualified enough for Jefferson to want him at the White House. 
right. yet is it causing problems there? So he could be having problems with that. And there's going to be some evidence that he becomes, he takes to drink. And he does commit suicide not long after in the same year, later in the same year. So I don't right. have the answer. See, I, one of the problems is we're, we're asking more questions than we're answering here, unfortunately. But well, that's, that's good. This gives people, maybe people who are listening know the answer and they can write it in the comments. Maybe, you know, maybe we have some scholars who have done some research in this specific well, topic. Well, the, the, the idea is sometimes it, it, it teaches you, here's a, a good answer, uh, a good example of an episode that uh, teaches people that historic, history is not always about an, ask, answering questions. Sometimes you broach a topic that's been highly neglected. Uh -huh. You go as far as you can with it. Then you ask questions for other people to, right. to pursue. That's a good example of doing good history. Right. Right. You, you do something. And that's what we try to do all the time in the show. If we, you know, either take something, clarify, clear things up, answer the questions, or take something that has been neglected, like this relationship. Everybody mm -hmm. writes about Sally Hammonds, but... To me, this is much more interesting. For one, I don't think anything ever happened between Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Two, we definitely know something happened between Jefferson and James Hammonds. What was that? Why is James so bitter, so unwilling to respond to Jefferson's reply that he come and be the cook? You know, but he doesn't. He refuses. Hmm. Uh, now, what does happen, I'll mention this is that James does come back at some time and he goes to Monticello and for a few weeks, I think it's a few weeks, he uh, is the cook at Monticello, but then he takes off again. Um, and then later we find out, uh, Jefferson writes on November 1, 1801, he writes to Evans, a report has come here through some connection of one of my servants that James Hemmings, my former cook, has committed an act of suicide. Um, as this, whether true or founded, will give uneasiness to his friends, will you be so good as to ascertain the truth and communicate? Um, and it turns out Evans writes back immediately, five, four days later, November 5, he writes to Jefferson, I received your favor from the first instant. I'm sorry to inform you that the report respecting James Hennings, he says Hennings, not Hemmings, uh, having committed an act of suicide was true. And why does everybody always call it an act of suicide? Why don't they just say suicide? Suicide is an act. Suicide implies act. So, mm. right? It's like people saying, I want to live my life. Instead of saying, I want I want to live my life happily, instead of just saying, I want to live happily. Well, what else are you going to live but your life? So anyways, uh, <laughs> I'm browsing again. Can you tell? Yeah. <laughs> Let's get to question number five. Okay. Well, at the hold letter's on, end. Finish, so I, since I made oh, every inquiry okay. at the time this melancholy circumstance took place, the result of which was that he had been delirious for some days previous to his having committed the act. And it was the general opinion that drinking too freely was the cause. Here we have, again, something they don't talk about at Monticello. Did James have a drinking problem? To what extent? Jefferson talks about in an earlier letter that James had a sort of penchant for drink, but he hasn't been drinking for a while. So you go back to the bottle. Now, I just want to end by saying, I don't think, you know, everybody just think that drinking caused his death. That happens very rarely for heavy drinkers, you know, where it's usually an accident that happens while you're drunk. You know, uh, was it William Holden's who hit his head on or Holden who hit his head on a table near his bed when he was drunk, and other people who are notorious alcoholics um, come to some bad end through being drunk. You know, drinking too freely is is very vague; it doesn't tell us. More than likely, you know, he could have been depressed, as you said, and in a bout of drunkenness, the alcohol plus the depression caused him to take his life. We really don't know, or could, there could have just been some accident. Now, we don't, right. what the letter to Evans says doesn't tell us that there was any accident involved where he smashed his head or something, or we don't know how he committed suicide. So, again, we're asking more questions. Maybe you have the answer somewhat. Do you have a, a Ouija board that you could? No. <laughs> um, are we ready for question number five now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little less than nine minutes. Okay. Question number I five. At letters I don't think end. it's going to take nine minutes for this one. Oh, well, I bet you can talk for nine minutes. I could. <laughs> and I, I know you could, too. Yeah. I just don't get the opportunity. 
right. Well, here you can. I'll, 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 I see the question. I'll make it short so you can you can blab, blab. You want blab, blab, blab. Okay. At Letters End, Jefferson writes, I am so much embarrassed in composing a good household for myself as in providing a good administration for our country. What exactly does he mean? It's a strange, I, I mean, I, I, he's sort of apologizing for asking questions about finding a chef. But the sentiment, to the best of my understanding, is really like saying, Look, you want me to run the country? I need to get my own house in order first, early on. Right. That's what I think he means. Okay. Right? And, and maybe this seems trite, uh, rather mundane, you know, that look, I want to get, I need to find a French chef so that everything can go on smoothly. But, uh, you know, we remember Jefferson's going to have those dinners where he has people from the Congress, you know, sometimes Federalists, sometimes Republicans over to dine with him uh, on alternatingly. And uh, he spends his own money doing that. And it winds up being a wonderful thing. He gets, it winds up being good for him because in some sense, he's got the Senate under his thumb in some sense that they're doing his bidding. I don't think he's, you know, everybody says he's doing it for that. He's having this dinner so that everybody can say, yeah, we like Jefferson, whatever he says we're going to do. I just think he was a, a nice man. He said he wanted to get to know his constituency. Sit down. Right. No, that's all. I, I don't think there's anything nefandous, meaning nefarious, involved yeah. in these dinners. So that's my take. If you have something different, I just think he's saying I need to get my house in order prior to worrying about the affairs of the nation. Yeah. Well, that's what I got out of it. Um, I was thinking yeah. maybe he was um, comparing. Trying to talk right now. Oh, oh talk Jefferson, now. he sounded like he wanted to add something. <laughs> Yes. Okay, Jeffy, we have seven minutes. Go ahead. <laughs> he, he chased after another dog this morning. Got through the window and oh. poor woman walking the dog. You know, he's a little guy, but he, you know, thought she was going to tear up the dog, and he didn't. He just would. You sit down over here, you monster. Oh, yeah. and that's what. So what do we? I mean, I guess unless you have something to add, we're pretty much done. Unless you have something to. Uh, oh. Well, you what I'd like to do. I guess I'd like to let the audience know that next week we'll we'll be alternating um, one work five questions with the real Thomas Jefferson show, and so next week with the real Thomas Jefferson show, um, we'll begin a series of um, between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, and the focus will be on the 1998 DNA study. Um, so I don't know how many segments we'll have in this series, but that will be, so every other week, it'll be the Thomas Jefferson show will be part of this series. The real Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. Yes. And, and is so, David going to be back with us next time for that? Um, well, depending on when we do it, because next week is Thanksgiving. So I don't know what we're going to do for a show. What is planned? So you guys on. are going to be drinking beer and watching football. Is that oh, right? right? No, no, <laughs> no. Um, I'll be I'll watching the, the Lions play at least. I, I, oh, yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, it's always the yeah. Lions. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's not part of the tradition, I guess, it's something to do. But anyways, I will see if we can't bring David. because I know David is heavily in, invested in uh, his interest is, is large so we, when it comes. To yeah, we may need to coordinate that to do it on when I'm thinking maybe when see what his schedule is like between now and Wednesday, because Thursday's Thanksgiving and then Friday. You know, I don't know if, if they have family coming into town and um, I should be free. Well, I got Jefferson the cats to feed for Thanksgiving. That's about it. <laughs> That's the extent of my familial involvement here as I got my family here. But uh, I don't complain. I, I live pretty well. So on. And, and we have fun with this show, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so I guess we're done and we're done. We got. We got time to spare here, so. Wow, I can't I'll, believe I'll, I'll it. Whip I this, be I'll whip this up together, and uh, we will see you sometime next week when we okay. coordinate with Dave that we can all meet, all right? Okay, sounds see good. See you later. Okay. Have a great Thanksgiving to you and everybody else. Okay, you too. Bye-bye.